I don't think that it would come as any great shock or surprise to any of you if I were to suggest that we have a substance abuse and substance addiction problem here in America. It would be unusual if you or your family or someone you care about has not in some way been touched by an addiction problem. One of the questions I get all the time is, why do people do that? Why do they engage in this self-destructive behavior that obviously is so harmful to them and to those around them? And that is a great question. I know from the outside looking in, it looks like it's fun. And uh, it's the party life, and it's what the beautiful people do, and it's what we do because we can, and we're enjoying it. And I would suggest to you that in my experience, that is really a myth. You know, addiction is not the problem. Addiction is not the problem. If you wash your hands 200 times a day, you do not have a hand-washing problem. You have an obsessive compulsive disorder problem. So the addiction is not the problem. You can chain an addict to a fence for 30 days, keep them from using, and they'll get sober. Now, I don't think they're going to stay sober. Stopping the use is part of the solution. It's not the whole solution. People use, abuse, and ultimately become addicted to drugs and alcohol because there's something broken inside. There's some deep wound that they're trying to medicate. It very often feels better to be numb than to face the pain. And unless you address that deep wound, that deep pain, you're not going to address, you're not going to successfully address the addiction problem and find a sober, vibrant, purposeful, and productive life in the future. So that's something you have to take a look at. What's driving the addiction? I want to show you this picture. This is a picture of the original Tommy James and the Shondells. Uh, you remember Tommy James and the Shondells? They had all those great hit records in the 1960s and 1970s. Remember the first record? My baby does the hanky-panky. You know, the lyrics, the profound lyrics that we had in those days for those songs, uh, just amazing, almost Shakespearean in content. But uh, in this picture, you see Tommy James in the center there uh, on the top row, but down on the bottom left, your left, is a guy named Craig Villeneuve. And Craig uh, was the keyboard player, the piano player for Tommy James and the Shondells. In fact, he played the piano on that song, Hanky Panky. Let me show you another picture. This is about... 12 years later, and uh, you see that I'm on the upper right there. That's what it would look like with a hairpiece. And uh, down on the lower left, kneeling down, is Craig Villeneuve. Now, he looks a lot older, doesn't he? He's got the beard going, and he really doesn't look very well. Well, I had hired Craig to come on tour with me in one of my bands. And we rehearsed for a week before we went out on the road, and the first thing I noticed about Craig during the rehearsal week was that he looked like he was pregnant. I mean, not just like a beer belly, but like this distended, kind of pregnant-looking thing for a guy. It really looked weird. Like a woman in her seventh or eighth month of pregnancy. And I thought that was caused, perhaps, because he drank so much water. I would see the guy walking around all the time with an eight-ounce glass just full of water. And I'm thinking, well, he likes to stay, high, stay hydrated, and that's where he keeps the water weight. Well, it didn't take too long before I was to learn that, that that glass really wasn't full of water. It was full of vodka. And Craig was an alcoholic. And I used to get so frustrated with him. Of course, I was young and I was insensitive and I didn't really understand addictions and what was going on inside of him. I used to get so frustrated with him and I was so mean to him because he could not remember his song parts from night to night. And I'd be like, Craig, come on, man. We do these songs every night. Can't you remember what you're supposed to play? Can't you remember what you're supposed to sing? You know, and I really wasn't very nice to him. And I got so frustrated with him, in fact, that uh, I, our group was viewed one night uh, by the McCoys, the group that had Hang On Sloopy, and they came to me afterwards and offered me a job in that band. And I thought, boy, that would be a lot easier than dealing with this frust frustrating alcoholic keyboard player. So uh, I decided to disband my group and join the McCoys. And so the last three weeks that we were together, we were up in La Crosse, Wisconsin, a beautiful place in the summertime. And I remember two specific things about the last time I saw Craig Villadu. Uh, number one, someone in the audience offered to buy him a drink. And so he ordered his usual triple vodka on the rocks. And I thought, man, 
this guy will never learn. The other thing I remember was how irritated I got with him because he was talking to the you know, customer that bought him the drink and he wouldn't help us get the thing going. And I wanted to move forward with my life and turn the page and move on to bigger and better things. And so I really wasn't nice to him at all that night. And I felt pretty bad about it later on. So about a month later, uh, I was uh, with the McCoys and we were performing at the Flamingo in Las Vegas. And I thought I would give Craig a call and uh, apologize to him for how mean I had been to him. So I called his home in Indiana and I said, hello, is Craig there? And his mother answered the phone and she said, who is this? And I said, this is Mike Marino. She said, oh, Mike, we lost Craig. And I'm thinking, what? And she said, yeah, he died. So just a couple of weeks before this guy died, I'm yelling at him because he's talking to a customer too long. That's how little I understood about addiction. But it did become crystal clear to me in that moment, during that phone call, that substance abuse, drug and alcohol addiction is a life and death proposition. And I have learned since then, and I would say this without fear of contradiction, that the addiction train only makes three stops. The addiction train only makes three stops. Misery, jail, and the graveyard. 